We are so excited to have you here at the Japanese American National Museum. And I hope you enjoyed your tour and the very special visit with Hal Kiemi. So my name is Kelly Nakayama, and I am one of the directors here at the museum. I'm in charge of raising millions of dollars each year to support the museum and programs just like the one today. But before I started working here at the museum, before I actually started working anywhere, I used to be a student at Fullerton as well. That's where I was born and raised too. <laughs> and I still live there today. I've got two sons, Seiji and Kenji, who are also students at Fullerton at Le Laguna Road and then a high schooler at Troy High School, where I think some of you will be going to as well. And I just wanna say that we are so lucky and we're so grateful to live in a community that has such a strong educational foundation and incredible school administrators, teachers, and parents. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few of your special guests here today. We have Dr. Julian Lee, our Associate Superintendent. <laughs> and Dr. Linda Ruiz, our Director of Educational Services. And our trustee, Ruthie Hanchett. So thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to say a very, and I hope you join me in this, a very, very big and warm thank you for the folks who are instrumental in organizing today's event. We want to give a big shout out to Pam Keller. <laughs> Miss Cindy Rivera, is she here? and Miss Nancy Karcher, whose daughter used to work here too. <laughs> so thank you so much. And um, so 30 years ago, the Japanese American National Museum was founded by the Japanese American community to share our history and experiences, including the unjust incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II, which you've learned about today. And we say here at Janum, we use the lessons of history to better understand our present and to help shape a more just future. And so today you've heard some pretty powerful stories, uh, stories of tragedy and unfair discrimination, as well as stories of resilience, hope, and community. And we use these experiences and draw upon these lessons uh, we hope that you use these experiences and draw upon these lessons in your everyday lives. Put what you've learned, what you felt while hearing these stories, and put it into practice in how you interact with others in the classroom, on the playground, with your families, and in your neighborhood. You have to stand up against discrimination and bullying. Use your voice and speak loudly, confidently, to protect others, especially for those who don't have a voice or it's been silenced or it's been ignored. So never forget what you learned today. Remember and carry these lessons of history with you so that what happened to Japanese Americans over 80 years ago never happens again to anyone else. This, this is an American story. It doesn't matter whether or not you're Japanese American, it's a story that all of our families can relate to. It's a story of our parents and our grandparents, many of whom were also immigrants as well. And all these stories matter because they shape who we are, what we believe in, and how we, how we see the world as well. So I had a grandfather who was also incarcerated during the war. He was a community leader and a very well-respected businessman here in Los Angeles and he helped start what is today known as Union Bank. And he was my age, my age exactly, when World War II broke out, and he had a wife and children and mother. And he was also incarcerated at the Santa Anita racetrack, and just like Hal, lived in a horse stall with his mom while he was there. And when I asked him about the war and the incarceration experience, he said, all I know is I lost everything. But that is a small matter when you consider everything. So his generous spirit, his generous and positive spirit, I think is captured in those two juxtaposed, those two opposite statements that are put together. 
On the one hand, it's an acknowledgement of, of deep and profound loss. And on the other hand, it's a release of that restrictive hold that it has on you in order to embrace a, a, embrace a broader life filled with gratitude and community. And it's been nearly 30 years since he's passed away, but those lessons and values that he shared with us when we were growing up continue to influence, influence and guide our lives today. So when you go home today, share what you learned with your friends and your family. And tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that, remind yourself why it's so important to be kind, understanding, empathetic, and welcoming to others. And remember what can happen if we let prejudice and discrimination overshadow reason and tolerance. There are still so many communities today who still suffer from the same discrimination that plagued the United States over 81 years ago. And it's up to all of us, all of us to stand up against hate. It's up to all of us to join hands together and stand up for justice. Thank you so much for joining us, and we encourage you to come back and visit us again often. Thank you. Hello, and hello to the Fullerton School District. I don't know if everyone remembers, but we have students from all 20 schools watching today. So a shout out to the Fullerton School mm -hmm. District. Yay. I'm Pam Keller. I'm a upper grade multi-age teacher at Orangethorpe Elementary. And I'm Nancy Karcher, and I am the primary multi-age teacher at Orangethorpe. So oh, we're going to make this a very short story, but the way we met our esteemed speaker today, Janice Munimitsu, is we were introduced to her from Sylvia Mendez. Sylvia Mendez is that famous woman who was a little girl who wasn't allowed to go to the school because of the color of her skin. And I'm going to tell everyone the secret. She lives seven minutes away from Orangethorpe Elementary School in Fullerton, right by the Fullerton Airport. She is a Fullertonian, just like all of us. So she's our friend, and she introduced us to this wonderful woman, Janice. And Mrs. Karcher is going to tell you a little bit about her. OK, well, Janice Munamitsu is a third generation Japanese American sensei, a native of Orange County, California. Janice worked on her family farm from age five through high school. She is a graduate of the University of Southern California, fight on, and <laughs> Biola University. Her family name, Munamitsu, means source of light in, can, do we say it? Kanji. Kanji, thank you. She hopes this book will be a source of light and hope and will inspire us all to cultivate increasing kindness towards one another. Wonderful. Aww. So welcome, and we're so excited. We brought you a little present from Orange Thorpe. We wanted to make you an official orca. So here's a shirt. I hope we'll wear it. Yeah. Thank you. I love right, orcas. I love yeah. all of you. Well, I love, usually when I go speak, people don't know who Sylvia is, and they don't know part of the story. So all of you, thank you to the teachers and staff at Orangethorpe, because you've done a great job in setting up our story. So I wanted, you know who Sylvia is. I'm Janice. I live in Orange County, too. I was born not in Fullerton, in Garden Grove, and went to Garden Grove School District, to Balsa Grande High School, and I still live in Orange County, too. I did live in Fullerton and worked there for about 10 years, so that's my connection. So let me just go ahead and start in on our story. Oops, sorry, this needs to turn on. So let's go back and talk about how this whole story started. This is Sylvia's parents, Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez. And Felicitas came from Puerto Rico. Do you know how far that is from California? It's a long way, right? It's on the other side of the United States uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, Caribbean area. But Felicitas came with her parents when she was a young girl, maybe about your age, and they came to work in California. 
Gonzalo came from Mexico, a little bit closer. He came from across the border. He was from Chihuahua, Mexico with his parents. He was probably a little bit older than you are, but about the same age. And he went to Westminster schools as well. They got married, and they were really hardworking people. They worked in the farms for a long while, and then they raised enough money so that they could start their own restaurant. So does everyone know where Santa Ana is in Orange County? OK, the Children's Museum is there, and the Bowers Museum is there. Well, that's where they lived. And they owned a house, and they also owned a restaurant. And they served really good food, I think, because they were really good, uh, well-known in the neighborhood. So that's uh, uh, Sylvia's parents. This is my grandparents, Seima and Masako Munamitsu. Now, where do you think they came from? Japan. Japan, yeah. You're right, they're from Japan. And where's that? It's really far away, right? Even today, I think it takes about 10 hours by airplane to get there, depending on the airlines. But, um, but my grandfather, this picture is from 1921, so it's over 100 years ago. Uh, when they came, and they came as a young couple. And one thing, look at my grandma's dress and my grandfather's suit. What do you notice about that? Sure. Yeah, okay. Now, they came here by ship. They came across the Pacific Ocean from Japan by ship, and they are all dressed up, as you mentioned, maybe like they're going to go out to dinner. Is there something else you notice about that picture? Oh, well, they weren't going to go for vacation. They were going to go for work, but you're right. They got off the ship. What about the kind of, is her dress a, a normal dress that maybe your grandmother might have worn? OK, what kind of dress is it? A kimono, you're right. So I think what's interesting about this picture is my grandmother has on a kimono, but my grandfather has on a Western suit. And this kind of suit maybe your great-grandparents wore too, right? So this is one of the things about our story, is even though they came from Japan, they wanted to live an American lifestyle. My grandfather has on a Western suit, and my grandmother still has on a Japanese kimono. But my grandfather really wanted to live in America because he had a picture of George Washington on his living room wall. I bet none of you have George Washington on your living room wall, do you? But I remember as a little girl thinking, oh, there is the first president of the United States. It's George Washington was on his living room wall. And I think that just shows how much he really embraced wanting to live and work hard and um, have his family in America. So in 1930s, my grandfather raised enough money so that he could lease a farm. He was working for somebody else, another farmer, but he was able to lease a farm, and he leased it in Westminster, California. And that's not very far from Fullerton, right? You know, kind of know where that is. Um, but this is kind of like what Westminster looked like back then. It was farmland. There weren't big Walmarts. There weren't grocery stores. It was farmland. And so you saw lots of barns like this and s really small little houses where the farmers would live. And this is what my grandfather was able to lease and start his own farming. My dad, this is my dad in high school. Do you think he's handsome? OK, yeah, I think my dad was handsome. But this is my dad. He went to Huntington Beach High School. Back then, there was only three high schools in all of Orange County. It was Santa Ana, Garden Grove, and Huntington Beach. But when my dad, that was his high school uh, picture. But when he was a younger boy, you could see him here with his brother, my uncle. My grandmother is in the back, and then another family friend with her little boy. That's what farming looked like in Westminster, right? They have on overalls. You could see the buildings are kind of older. And back there, those buildings in the back, that's where our workers would live. So back then, because the workers would come, and a lot of them came from Mexico, they didn't have a house to live in. So the farmers would have houses for them to live. And so that's, that's where they would live. And then the little white house is where our family lived. Now, my dad has a really interesting name. Seiko is a Japanese name, but his middle name is Lincoln. 
What does that remind you of? Abraham Lincoln. Right, and we just celebrated Abraham Lincoln's birthday on, uh, you know what day? How about February? February 12th. I know, time flies. Okay, February 12th. Well, guess what day my dad was born? Pretty close. He was born February 13th. You guys all got it right. He was born on February 13th. Now, you have to think about this. My grandparents are a young couple. They're in love. They have their first son, and they name him Lincoln, right? Because his birthday is on February 13th, right after President Lincoln's birthday. But guess what? My dad always used to say, oh, he was so glad that they didn't name him Valentine because he was born the day before Valentine's Day. And can you imagine Seiko Valentine Munamitsu? Oh, my dad was really lucky that they didn't choose that name. But they know his um, nickname was Tad. So everyone called him Tad throughout his whole life. <laughs> yeah, Tad like dad, right? Um, but here's a kind of a couple, one sad thing about my dad. Have you heard of polio? Okay, polio was a very, very terrible disease. And that if like we just had a COVID um, pandemic, polio was the pandemic of that time. So my dad had polio and it caused paralysis. And his leg, one of his legs was very deformed. So he walked with a limp. Now that's also like one of our presidents of the United States who was struck by polio. And I think you know who I'm talking about. Do you know who, which president had polio? Abraham Lincoln. No. Washington? No. Think about 1940s. Okay, let's try President Roosevelt. Okay, President Roosevelt also had polio, and he actually was in a wheelchair because he lost the ability to, to walk. But my dad, so my dad, you can remember him, his middle name's Lincoln, and he had polio like President Roosevelt, by, like FDR. The other thing about my dad is when he was a little kid, he got the chance, um, this is kind of maybe a harder concept, but he got the chance to own land. So here he is, a little kid, like 10, 12 years old, and because his father, my grandfather, came from Japan, was not born in the United States, at that time, the law was that you had to be born in the United States to own land. And it was really a racist issue. It was really discrimination against Asians and other people from who had immigrated. So the lady who um, my grandfather leased the farm from, she wanted to, when she passed away, she wanted my grandfather to buy the land. But because he wasn't a born citizen of the United States, the law said he could not own it. So they went to their banker, Mr. Frank Monroe, who had a bank in Garden Grove. And Frank Monroe, he was white, but he had customers who were Mexican and Japanese, and he treated everyone equally. And so Frank thought, hmm, how can we make this work? So even though my dad had a mother and father, if he had a guardian, someone who was an American-born citizen who could stand for him as his guardian, then my dad could legally own land as a little kid. And that's what they did. So that, because of the kindness of Mr. Frank Monroe, who was a banker, and he was doing his job, but he went over and above to really mentor and really care about our family, my dad was able to own land and really, my grandfather you know, was running the farm because my dad was only about 12 years old. But that's how we got to own land. And you think about it, a lot of people were not able to own land. Even though they came here, they worked hard, they wanted to own their own farm or business because of the alien land law that was against people who were not born in the United States to own land, they could not. So that was a huge blessing for our family. In my book, I have a lot of kindnesses statements. And this is one I think you can all relate to. 
Kindness is taking time to help others no matter how young they are. That's what this Mr. Monroe, this banker did. He took time to help my dad, even though my dad was just a young kid. And this would be his friend for the rest of my dad's life. So here's a family picture here. Uh, you could see my dad's all grown up, and my uncle, and then my grandfather, and my grandmother. And now, here's two twin sisters, right? And then another lady who is my uh, grandfather's stepmother. But can anyone guess what the names of the little girls are? I think you know one of them. Aki, yes, one is Aki, and one is Kazi. So Aki is the one on the right, and her twin sister is Kazi. Because I know you've all read Sylvia and Aki, right? OK, well, that's Aki as a little girl. I'd like to show this picture, too, because again, here's Aki, and here's Kazi, my aunties. And they have on Japanese dresses. They have on Japanese kimonos. But they never had been to Japan at that time. So somebody must have sent these Japanese kimonos so that little Japanese American girls could have them and wear them. But what are they holding? They're, they're holding dolls. And do those dolls look like Aki and Kazi? No, they look blonde and brown haired, right? But look how proudly Aki and Kazi are holding their dolls. And this is my grandmother. So remember that picture you saw of my grandmother in a Japanese kimono? Well, look now, she has on a Western dress. And just for dress up fun, my aunts got to wear their Japanese kimonos holding their blonde baby dolls. So here's another way of keeping our culture of where, they, where my grandfather or grandmother came from, but yet now they live in, um, in America where there are blonde baby dolls. This is what I call cultural blending and living out your culture and keeping that, but also living an American lifestyle. We already talked about this, and Mr. Hal did a great job talking about his experience. So I'll just kind of refer to it. But on December 7th, 1941, Japan, the country of Japan at that time, bombed Pearl Harbor. And that launched us into World War II. Now, Pearl Harbor is a very, very sad part of our story because thousands of innocent people and people who were in the military died from that. And it was a very horrible thing that happened in Pearl Harbor, Honolulu, Hawaii. But what happened is because Japan and Japanese people who lived in Japan looked pretty much the same as my grandparents and parents, that's, what, that's where the US government and people who did not see um, people as equal, started to be very suspicious of people like my grandparents and my parents. Now, my dad was 20 years old, Aki was seven, and Kazi was seven. So, and as you heard, all these stories, they, they suspected children and mothers and sisters and brothers didn't matter, as well as their fathers, about this. Uh, this issue of racism and that Perhaps we could be enemies. At this time, my grandfather had lived in the United States for 26 years. And I think if he was going to be an enemy of the United States in 26 years, they would have figured that out, right? But he, remember, he's the guy who had George Washington on the wall, and he named his first son Lincoln. That's how much my grandfather loved the United States. But yet, he was suspected of being a spy for Japan. February 19, 1942, is when President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. And that said that all the Japanese people in Washington, Oregon, and California would have to leave their homes, and they would have to go to these incarceration camps, just like the one that the barrack um, that you saw in the Japanese American National Museum's exhibit. And we talked a little bit about that already. But from that date on, my father and grandfather, they didn't know what was going to happen because um, they were farming. They were farming in Westminster, but they knew at some point they would have to leave that farm. And in fact, in May, so just about three months later, um, I think you may have heard some stories where people, even in December, had to leave their homes. 
but in Westminster, it was about more like three months later when the FBI actually came and arrested my grandfather because they thought he was a spy. Now, I don't know, but you've seen my couple pictures of my grandfather. Did he look like a spy? Did my grandmother look like she was a, a spy? No, and Aki and Kazi were seven years old. How many of you are seven years old? Quite a few, right? So some of you are maybe eight or six, but they weren't spies. But the government thought because they looked like the enemy, because they had Japanese blood and Japanese skin and hair and eyes, that they were, they were suspect of being spies. So my grandpa, in this picture, he is the top, at the very top on the right. He's, that's him. And this was in a Department of Justice camp. It was separate. All the women and children of these men were in a different camp than my grandfather because these men were all being interrogated about what did they know about the bombing of Pearl Harbor and what did they know about Japan and Japan's military goals. And they knew nothing because they were Japanese Americans living here in the US with no ties to Japan. Three days later, in the same week, my grandmother, my uncle, and my dad left to go to Poston, Arizona. Poston, how many of you know where Arizona is? Okay, how many, is it far from California? It's a state right next to California, but you have to go through the desert to get there, right? And the desert is really hot, very hot. And, and can be very cold too, like today I bet the desert's really cold, right? But we know that out in the desert not much grows and it's really hot and really cold. Well, that's what Post in Arizona is like. It is right on the other side of the Colorado River, the California-Arizona border, and it actually is a Native American reservation, Indian reservation, where the Mojave, the Chemehuevi, the Navajo, and the Hopi tribes live. Now, one of the things about here again is Aki. You know about Aki from Aki and Sylvia, or Sylvia and Aki. And then this is Kazi. They had chicken pox that week. So what do you think? You can't, when you're sick with chicken pox, you can't travel to Poston. So what happened is my aunts, just the two little girls, went to the hospital where nurses, really kind nurses, took care of them for two whole weeks. And my grandmother had to leave them behind. So my grandmother had to go with her two sons to Poston. And Aki and Kazi were left in a hospital in Westminster. Now, I always think that I'm so thankful that they had each other, right? Because if it, you had to stay there by yourself, that would be so scary. And that would be so like, everyone left me. But because they had each other, they had their sister, they were able to kind of just say, OK, we're together, and we can stay here and get well. So it took them about two weeks to get well. But once they got well, they were able to go to, uh, to Poston. And the, uh, one of the nurses from the hospital took them there. And my aunt Aki was, she was just excited to go on a train. She never realized that she wasn't going to go back to her house. She wasn't going to go back to the farm. Her father wasn't going to be there. The only time she started to get worried about that was when the train came to Poston and she could see out the window, she saw her mother. She saw my grandmother, Masako, and it's like, oh, there she is, there's mom, there's mom. And my grandma was just standing there crying. She was just crying tears because she missed her daughter so much. Her husband is not with them. He's in another camp. She's there with her two sons, but it's a hot desert. There's, and the beds were very, there were wood frames, but the mattresses, you had to put uh, straw in a, in a sheet to even have any kind of mattress, and straw is not very soft. But at least her girls were coming home. And so when you went to the camp, they gave you family numbers. Your family had a number. And because my aunts came after the rest of the family, my dad, my uncle, and my grandmother are 24132. And Aki and Kazi were 20344 A and B. 
So they gave you a number and they assigned you to a very small space like the one you saw here at the museum. It was only about 20 feet by 25 feet and that's where your beds were, that's where you kept your clothes and you had to go and um, for the toilet or for the showers you went to a communal uh, house that was far away. It wasn't right next door. You had to walk to get there and there was no privacy. And so this is what camp life was like. We now know that there were more than 120,000 Japanese Americans there. The lists were very unorganized up until two or three years ago. But now we know that maybe it's more like 125,000 Japanese Americans were moved into these camps, and there were 10 of them. I think um, you'll see we have two in California, two in Arizona, one in Utah, one in Colorado, one in Idaho, Wyoming, and two in Arkansas. How far away from us is Arkansas? It's far. It's in, a, it's in several time zones different than us, right? But this is all the different places that the government put up camps, incarceration camps, and moved the Japanese people. Colorado River in Post in Arizona almost had 18,000 people there. That's a lot of people. And at this time in 1942 in Arizona, this was the third largest city in all of Arizona. That's how many people it was. It was Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, where all people lived like a normal city. And then in the middle of the desert, there was 18,000 Japanese, and that would have been the third largest city in Arizona at that time. So we're talking about a lot of people's lives were affected. And I always like to say, I'm telling you one story, my family story. There's 120,000 other stories out there. Every family has a different story. Now, what happened to that 40-acre farm? The farm that was in my grandfather and my dad's name in Westminster. When they left, they had to figure out what's going to happen to this farm. Many Japanese had to sell their farms, their houses, their businesses, and people took advantage of them. They knew they had to leave, and so instead of giving them the full price and the full value, they gave them just pennies for what they owned. So people lost a lot of their hard-earned um, assets, the property that they owned. They lost houses and trucks and cars and all of their household belongings, furniture. So my dad goes back to his friend, Mr. Frank Monroe at the bank, and Frank Monroe says, you know what, I think this war will end. Now this is World War II, the whole world has, is fighting each other. There's people on one, countries on one side, countries on the other side, and they're all fighting, but Frank Monroe says, I think this will end. So he was a man of hope. And he said, let's try to lease the farm. So typically you might lease a house or you might lease a business or a car, but he said, let's lease the whole farm. And that meant all 40 acres, all the asparagus that was in the, in the ground, the barn, the hose, the shovels, the um, house, all the furniture in the house, so everything. And guess who he leased it to? Who do you think? Sylvia. Sylvia's dad, Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez, Sylvia's mom and dad. They had always wanted to be farmers. They were running their restaurant, and they had a really nice restaurant, but they said they always wanted to be farmers. And so they stepped in to lease our farm. And it's real, this, the pictures of these documents, these papers you see, this is the document that my dad signed with Gonzalo Mendez. It's, it's called a lease document, and they're contract documents. And right now they're at Chapman University in the city of Orange, in Orange County. But these are the documents that specified that Gonzalo would lease the farm and basically take care of it, and he would pay my dad uh, to lease it, but he would get the profits from the uh, asparagus farm. So that's how Gonzalo and Felicitas came to our farm. One of the kindness statements I put in here is, kindness is collaboration in building trusted 
friendships. And my dad did not know Gonzalo. Gonzalo didn't know my dad. <laughs> but they both knew Mr. Frank Monroe. And because Mr. they both trusted Mr. Monroe, they could trust each other. And I think this is a really important concept. As you make friends and as you meet your teachers and different aides in your, in your schools, and as you meet neighbors and friends maybe on a uh, Boy Scout troop or Girl Scout troop, this is where you build these trusted friendships that are so important, especially in hard times. So th that's how my dad got to meet Gonzalo, was through his friend, Mr. Monroe, the banker. Now, does anyone have any questions about the, my family story part? I'll stop and ask if you have one or two. And if not, we'll just keep going. Sorry, it's hard to see you, so you'll have to. OK, I think I'll keep going if, oh, do you have one? Oh, OK, sorry. How did you feel when you had no privacy? How did, how did my grandmother and mother and aunties feel? Very terrible. Japanese are very, very private people, and they have a very high respect for cleanliness. So now they're in a place where there's no privacy, and it's not clean. And so it was very, very um, discouraging. It was very disgraceful. Um, my, I have some stories where, like, if I were to go to the bathroom with my friend, my friend would hold up, like, a towel or a sheet to give me some privacy, or my grandmother w would hold it up for Aki or Kazi, but it was very, very difficult, and especially for Japanese culture, because we're just people who like things to be neat and clean and have some privacy. Um, I think a lot of you would, would, you like your privacy too when you go to the bathroom, right? Or when you take a shower. It's, you don't want, you want to have your own space, but there was no own space in the camps. We have a question over here. Okay, go ahead. Um, how old is your mom and your dad? My dad, uh, both of them have passed and they're in heaven now. But my dad would have been 101 years old, and then my mom in September would be 100. So that makes me pretty old, huh? <laughs> OK, go ahead and just ask. I can't see you very well, so. What was in the camp? What was in the camp? The camps were structured, um, I'll talk about Poston. But it's very much similar to the others. Um, there was barbed wire around the camp, very high barbed wire. There were guard gates where they had soldiers that were not worried about people coming in. They were worried about people escaping. And so they had guns. And anyone who tried to escape would get shot at. Then they had barracks where they lived. So every barrack was numbered. And each barrack had four living quarters. So there would be apartment one, two, three, four. But when I say apartment, it was really just a room. There was no kitchen, no uh, bathroom facilities. It was just one big room where they put the beds there, and maybe they could make a chair or something to sit at at night. But there was no TV. They had some uh, lighting, electricity. Um, but again, it wasn't like your, when you think of an apartment today or something, it wasn't anything like that. It was basically just one bare room maybe with a window and these wood beds um, that needed, you had to make your own mattress out of sheets and straw. So it's really, really, it's not even, I mean, today we have camping equipment that's better than what they had. What kind of food did they have? Not very good food. <laughs> Like, what my, did it taste like? Uh, pretty bad, I think. My aunt, um, my pa my family, they eat almost everything. But there's a few things that my aunts remember from the camp that they did not want to eat. The government gave them just kind of basic rations, and it wasn't fresh. 
And if you think about it, our Japanese family, we are farmers, and so we grew fresh vegetables, and we had fresh fish, and we could get these fresh foods that we we're so used to eating, but none of that was in the camp. So they had like canned green beans and canned beans and canned meat and things that even today I don't think sound very good. So the food was not very good. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. Uh -huh, it's on. Go ahead and speak loud. Why did Japan bomb America? Good question. Um, that's a big question, but I think it's about power and control. That's why these countries were all fighting, because they wanted to be more powerful. I think it's really, really dangerous when you want to be more powerful and try to control other countries and other innocent people. But that's a, that's a big question, but that's kind of the basic part of it, OK? Hi, um, live audience. I know we've got um, Orange Thorpe, Woodcrest, Beechwood. There might be more schools, but if you're out there, you can um, type your questions into the live chat, and Mr. West will read them for you. Okay, thank you. So let's go on to this Sylvia Mendez part of the story. And this is a part of the story I think a lot of you are familiar with. But when Sylvia was eight years old, she and her brothers went to the Westminster 17th Street School right by the farm, and they wanted to enroll. And they were told, because you're Mexican, your last name's Mendez, and your skin is dark, you have to go to the Mexican school. The Mexican school was called Hoover School. And the problem with Hoover School is they didn't teach the subjects you learn. They didn't teach. They taught the kids to speak English. But already knew how to speak English. So this was a problem. And this school was not a safe school either. It did not have really good facilities like your school does. It didn't have really nice desks with books. It didn't have a safe playground. It had no place to eat lunch. And so it wasn't a safe school either. So when Sylvia went, when they went home and told their father about this school, their father said, no, that's not a, we're not going to uh, stand for that. We're going to go talk to the principal of the school, and I'm going to get you into the regular 17th Street School where there was regular subjects, and it was a safe environment for children. But when Gonzalo, Sylvia's dad, went to the school and went to the school district and went to the county school um, board of education, they said, no, no, your kids are Mexican. They have to go to that school. So he decides to hire an attorney. And he hired David Marcus. And David Marcus was an attorney who cared about equality for children. And he cared about making sure that these children, these Mexican children, could have a good education. And so Mr. Marcus, uh, Gonzalo could hire him. And you know attorneys are expensive, right? And so Mr. Uh, Mendez, he hired Mr. Marcus because he made some profit off of the asparagus farm. The other families that joined Mr. Mendez were the Palomino, Ramirez, Estrada, and Guzman families. And they went to US federal court in Los Angeles, all the way from Westminster. And there were no freeways like the one you took today to get here. There were no freeways at this time. So it was a long way to drive to Los Angeles. But when Mr. Marcus went to that court, this took months and months, but I'm going to give you a quick summary. He decided to uh, file in federal court, not California state court, because at that time in California, California law said it was OK to have separate schools for Chinese, Japanese, and Native American students. And so there was already segregation. And he didn't want them to add Mexican students to that list. So he went to federal court. And because of the 14th Amendment of our Constitution and the Equal Protection Clause, he was going to say that American citizens, these young children, were being unfairly treated. So in 1945, these families had courage to stand up for what is fair and just 
and they went to court in Los Angeles, not too far, just really down the street from the Japanese American National Museum was where the courthouse is. And they went into court, and it took them like six days. And Sylvia, her brothers, all the children of these five families were there to um, talk about this case and to plead for the judge to really understand the unequal amount of um, racism and discrimination that was being put at them by not giving them equal education. So the judge heard it, but you know, these legal things take a long, long time. And so the judge took seven months to make a decision. Meanwhile, our family is getting ready to leave the camp. So we've got Gonzalo and Felicita, Sylvia, Gonzalo Jr. and Jerome, her two brothers, all living in the Minamitsu farmhouse. But now, my grandfather and my dad and Aki and Kazi and grandma were all ready to come back. So they do something really interesting. They collaborate together for a win-win solution. Do you know what a win-win solution is? Yeah? What is it? Yeah, it's like they both get equal rights and they get what they need, right? They both get a win on their solution. It's not like one loses and one wins. They both work hard to figure out how both of them can win. And that's what they did. So Gonzalo needed to stay in Westminster because of the legal case. And he also had spent all of his money on the legal case. All the money he made from that asparagus farm he had spent uh, to fight the case in court. So he could not leave to start a new business. And my dad and grandpa, Aki and Kazi, and my grandmother needed a place to live. So what they did is in the contract, they said that Gonzalo would hire my grandpa and my dad to work on the farm that they owned, and Gonzalo would take the profit from that. And so even though my dad and grandpa owned the farm, they were gonna work for Gonzalo for that year just so that this could be a win-win solution. So it would be like you giving up something you really wanted for somebody else so that they could also proceed and have a win, but you're gonna give it up, but then in a year, you will get it back. So this is the kind of collaboration we're talking about is where it's not selfish, it's about thinking about the other and trying to make their what they need work out as well as what you need. And this takes a lot of discussion, so you can't always just say, well, I want it my way, right? This was where my dad said, Gonzalo, what do you need? And he, Gonzalo said, Tad, what do you need? And they found a way to work it out. So finally, seven months later, the judge of that federal court case, Judge McCormick, he ruled in favor of the families, and he says a really important thing. The paramount requisite in the American system of public education is social equality. It must be open to all children, regardless of lineage, regardless of color. So that's why today you have students from all different heritages, from all different colors in your schools and in the school I went to and probably Pam went to. And that's what happened in California back in 1946. So Sylvia and her brothers were able to go to school, but the other families lived in other school districts, and those school districts still wanted to fight this case. They did not want the Mexican students in their school. So we go to the next step of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in December of 1946 through April of 1947, but the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says, we agree with Judge McCormick that there should be equal education and there should be no segregation in the schools. Meanwhile, the California government um, introduces a bill called the Anderson Bill. And this was passed by the Senate and the State Assembly in California, uh, Governor Earl Warren all signed off on this and that bill in 1947 desegregated made segregated schools illegal. They desegregated all the schools in 1947, seven years before the rest of the country. And Earl Warren would go on to be the Supreme Court Justice 
the Chief Justice in 1954, and Brown versus Education was the legal case that desegregated all of the United States. But as Sylvia Mendez always likes to say, California was first, and it's because of Mendez versus Westminster. Here's the Mendez family, Sylvia, and then in the bigger picture, it's her brother Jerome, Sylvia, her sister Sandra, her brother Gonzalo, and her brother Philip. And notice Sylvia has this beautiful, it almost looks like a necklace, but see this big medal around her neck? What do you think that is? Does anyone know? You know? Yes, President Obama gave it to her because Sylvia did something big. Good answer. And it's called the Medal of Freedom, and it's the highest award that a, a regular American can get. And it's because she told this story about what her family, the Mendez, Palomino, Ramirez, Estrada, and Guzman families, when they went to court, she has told that story for over 30 years so that we can know this history, because history is important. We don't want this to ever happen again where students are segregated and can't have the same education, as well as what you learned today at the Japanese American National Museum. We also do not ever want to see Japanese American citizens and residents who are innocent go into our incarceration camps. And so that's a picture of their family. Oh. And this is Poston. Uh, I just want to show you a quick picture. This whole area is a Native American re uh, Indian reservation. And Poston, the camps were right in the middle there. Those little uh, checkerboard boxes. So you could see there's nothing out in the middle of the desert. This is a really desolate place. Today it looks more like this. There's a monument. There's a train station that was there in the 1940s. And then um, you. I put some um, memorial bricks here of many families to remember their families who lived out in the middle of the desert. But you could see the background. See back there, there's maybe a few house roofs, but out there it's pretty much just flat desert in Poston. So this story is about sacrificing for the good of others. We talked about the Japanese American families who were in the internment camps, incarceration camps, behind barbed wire, but yet, their sons and daughters went to fight the war in Europe um, with the American troops. We had Mexican families that were denied but fought for equal education. And Mr. Monroe, who is a Caucasian white banker who did not discriminate and helped both of our families, he served us well. We have a Jewish attorney, Mr. Marcus, who fights for and a Catholic judge who upholds the law that all Americans should have equal rights. And then you may have heard of these two famous men, uh, black attorneys, Robert Carter and Thurgood Marshall, were very famous judges. But when they were young attorneys, they knew about Mendez versus Westminster, and they signed um, a, their letter of support. And then the Colorado River Indian tribe and our Japanese American uh, community continues to get together and we have pilgrimages and to remember what happened so that we don't forget because we never want this to happen again. And so I just want to close. This is a picture of Sylvia and I just last fall when Westminster School District, we celebrated 150 years of uh, Westminster School District. And it's kind of funny. This is a school district that didn't want Sylvia to go to school. And now, 150 years later, they're celebrating all of her achievements and this story. So now, do we have a minute for a couple quick questions? OK, a couple quick questions. Whoever, wants, whoever has the mic? There was a question from YouTube stream. OK. That That's was from Beachwood. Miss Rose class would like to know, students would like to know if Aki is still living. And if so, where does she reside? Yes, my Aunt Aki is, I'll tell you how old she is. She's 87 years old, and she's living with her daughter um, in Tennessee. And she's very healthy. I think she would have loved to be here today, but it's a long way to come. And so, um, but she is very well, and she loves the fact that all of you have read Sylvia and Aki. It's really nice. Thank you. Next question. All right. 
If you have the microphone, go ahead and ask your question. What happened to the dolls? The dolls, okay. So the, in the book, Sylvia and Aki, there's dolls that they both play with. And the author of that book wrote a good story based on a lot of true facts, but the dolls are not factual. So the story is a combination of true fact and also fiction, which is a part of the story she made up. So unfortunately, there are no dolls. Sorry. <laughs> Tough to break that to you. But that's the difference between fictional books, which are made up stories, and nonfiction books, which are true history. How much money uh, did the Mendes family pay the Minamitsu family? Oh, for the lease? You know what, that's a good question, but I'd have to go look that up. But it wasn't very much per year. I mean, it's not thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, but I'd have to look it up. It's probably maybe about a couple thousand dollars to lease that land because things were a lot less expensive then. When your aunties were sent separately, um, were they also housed separately from your grandmother and, and the uncles? And when they got to posting camp, no, they were actually in the same room, but because they came in at different times, their, their numbers were different. But no, they lived together in the same unit. It was 446B was their address in Poston. Um, what was, uh, what do you think the three biggest emotions that uh, Aki felt in the internment camps were? So the question was, what do I think the three biggest emotions were for Aki and our family in the internment camp? Yeah. I think a lot of it was shock that this could actually happen as American citizens. I think it was disappointment in that people really thought that they could be spies and that this could happen. And then I think too, the one thing though that our family had is my grandfather, they kept to, uh, having hope because they had people like Mr. Mendez and Mr. Monroe and other friends in uh, Orange County that really supported them and tried to help them. So I think it was a mix, as you mentioned, a mix of emotions. Go ahead. Next question. If you have the mic, speak. Um, what was one of your favorite childhood meals? My favorite childhood meal? Mm. Hmm. I really like Mexican food. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, when I worked, uh, when I grew up as a little kid, my dad had workers that lived um, all together, and there was a man who, who uh, cooked for them. And he actually, back in 1960s, he actually had a tortilla making machine. And if at the end of the day, if I went with my dad in the truck to take these men back to the place where they lived, his name was Limon, and Limon would bring me a paper bag sack of fresh corn tortillas. And so that's a childhood memory. It's not the whole meal, but it was really, really good. Next, who has the mic? Go ahead How? and speak. Me. How oh. hot was it? In posting camp, it could be really hot, like 120 degrees in the summer, and then in the winter it was really cold, like today, like 30s and 40s. So as you saw that wood barrack in the museum, you could tell that it had very, very thin walls and no insulation. So it was very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter and very windy in the desert and dusty. Um, where is Aki and Sylvia friends, or you were friends with Aki? I mean, oh, okay, so are Sylvia and Aki still friends? Okay, back in about 20 years ago, I got the chance to meet Sylvia, and so I called Aki and said, Aki, let's go meet her. And Aki was shy, she's kind of shy, and she's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. I said, fine, I'll go by myself. And then she said, oh, I want to come with you. So, so about 20 years ago, they got to see each other again, but they hadn't seen each other since they played together when the two families lived together on the farm. Good question, thanks. So, but now they are still friends, even though they, my aunt lives in Tennessee, so it's kind of far. They don't see each other very often. How Me clean? Mm -hmm. 
Wait, how um, clean were the bathrooms, bathrooms in Arizona? Well, there wasn't a lot of, it was hard to keep them clean because there was so much dust and wind, but I know they tried to clean them as much as they could. But it wasn't going to be anything like what you have at your house or what you have at your school. It was going to be much, much dirtier than that. But they did try their best to keep it clean. When was the last internment camp shut down? 1945. Good question. Did they celebrate, like, uh, birthdays or holidays? In the camps? Yeah, they tried the parents, uh, the second-generation parents, try to make it as, as normal as they could for their children. Of all those 125,000 uh, people, Japanese, that were in the camps, almost two-thirds of them, 70% of them, were American citizens, but they were all young people, like uh, in their 20s or through children age. So they tried to have as normal of a life they could for the children, even though it wasn't very normal. And that's why you had Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and baseball teams. It wasn't because they were trying to have fun, uh, because it wasn't fun, but they were trying to make the best of it for their kids and trying to give the kids as normal of a life as they could. How long was the fight? How long was the war? Yeah. Is that what you mean? World War II ended in 1945. And it began much earlier, but the U.S. entered it in 1941, at the end of 1941. Next how question. Many, how many Japanese Americans were there? In California, Arizona, uh, Oregon, and Washington, there's about 125,000 Japanese, and that was just along the West Coast. There were some other uh, areas of the country where Japanese lived, but the majority were all along the Washington, Oregon, California uh, coastline and along the Pacific Ocean, and that was about 125,000. These are all great questions. You guys have really studied, I could tell. You ask better questions than a lot of adults. <laughs> any Do other? any uh, animals slip through the barbed wire fence? Oh, in Poston? Yeah. Yeah, well, you can imagine. What kind of animals live in the desert? Rattlesnakes. Scorpions. Scorpions. Horned toads. A lot of bugs. Flies. Ticks. Maybe ticks, too. Yeah, so, so all those normal, I mean, all those animals that could get through the fence would try, and it was up to the adults to try to keep those away from the children. Next question. Um, if I were, if Jap, if I was, since I'm Japanese, w if I was in, in that time, would I have been in the, the internment camps? Yeah, if you were Japanese American, either born in the U.S. or Japanese who lived, who came from Japan, you would have been one of the people who would have had to go leave your house, leave your school, and go into one of the camps. And it didn't matter if you were little, because Aki and Kazi were only seven years old. So it didn't matter. You went with your whole family. Good question. Thank you. How old Excuse is me. Um, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Yeah, how did they get the water? Like. Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, if you go to a uh, Colorado River Indian tribe right now, and if you were to ask that question, where do you get the water, they would say the Japanese men built canals from the Colorado River and brought water to the camp. And that's how the Native Americans who live there, they still irrigate their uh, fields and their crops by that same canal system that the Japanese built. How, how old was Aki when she left the internment camp? Aki, uh, she went in at seven years old. She was there for three years, so she's 10 when she left. Basically about the fourth grade. Did you go to the uh, camps? No, because I was born after that. My parents got married after the camp. When is Aki's birthday? In May. 
Uh, it's, it's like May 26th. If you want to send her a birthday card, let me know. I, we can, I can uh, send it. If you send it to your teacher or give it to your teacher, I'll send it to Aki. Or actually, you know what? I might see her because my uncle is going to turn 100 years old this year, and there's a party for him. So I might actually see Aki in May. Okay, uh, maybe, how are you doing? One more question? Happy birthday in May. Okay. How old was Aki when it was World War II? Seven. Seven years old. How old are you? Nine. Nine? So she was two years younger than you are. Okay, thank you for all your questions. If you have questions that I didn't answer, if you could write them down and give them to your teacher, she can send them to me, and I will answer every question. But thank you very much. You guys are great. Oh, oh, oh. And can I take a selfie? Yes. Okay, okay, guys. I'm going to take a selfie. Okay, ready? Okay, let's do, I'll do this section. This section. That section. Okay. I was sitting in the middle. Stand in the middle. Okay. Do you have a book? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it'll work with the light. Okay. You got teachers and educators in the group. You are great. Hello. We want to say another a thank you to Mr. Wes and Mr. Pablo. We've up there, they made this happen today. Without them, we couldn't have done it. So that's super awesome. Thank you, Mr. West and Mr. Pablo. And thank you, Janice. All right, listen to your teachers. So don't.